I'd like to welcome everyone to the webinar series of the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, CSIAC. Today's presentation is entitled, Publishing Domain-Specific Source Code for Reuse and Maintenance. My name is Steve Warzala. I'm the CSIAC Outreach Manager. A few administrative notes before we begin. Questions may be asked at any time during the presentation by utilizing the chat function. And time permitting, your questions will be answered at the end of the session. Today's briefing slides will be posted on Techopedia within a few days. And finally, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge and thank our sponsor, the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC. Funding that DTIC provides <coughs> enables CSIAC to conduct these webinars. It's my pleasure to introduce our presenter for today's webinar, Dr. James Fawcett. Jim is a teaching professor emeritus of computer engineering at Syracuse University. He has six decades of experience in both industry and academia. From 1991 to May 2019, uh, Doc Fawcett taught graduate software engineering courses focused on methods and strategies for the design, development, and management of large and complex distributed software systems. Previously, he worked in various roles uh, for General Electric. I'm going to toss the presentation over to uh, Dr. Fawcett. Good afternoon, Jim. The floor is now yours. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm happy to be here with you. Um, so. Today, we're going to talk about uh, publishing domain-specific source code. And so let's cut to the chase. So uh, the model here is, is a, uh, I'm developing a model for publishing and presenting and deploying domain-specific code, meaning code that is related to some perhaps niche area, uh, could be academic teaching, uh, academic research, uh, if uh, could be uh, for a radar manufacturer, you know, supporting source code uh, that uh, is reused in uh, various versions of their product, something like that. So. So our focus is going to be in supporting that publication process where the goal, ultimate goal is to uh, support reuse and maintenance. <clears throat> so um, as part of this talk, we're going to uh, define salvage and reuse quickly, uh, talk about what it, uh, what it takes to publish uh, uh, source code uh, components, uh, effectively, and um, those first two are really models, and then um, the repository structure is the beginning of a uh, discussion about our implementation of uh, those models, and we'll wind up talking a little bit about uh, managing the quality of the contents uh, of our code repositories, and uh, uh, a little bit about some experimenting uh, we've been doing to try to make that process effective, and finally, draw a couple of quick conclusions. So uh, our focus is uh, on uh, reuse, supporting reuse, and that comes in a couple of flavors. Uh, I like the term salvage, meaning that uh, we have a uh, body, a modest body of software that will um, be adopted from some other application and modified uh, to fit into a current application. So again, if we're a radar manufacturer, the signal processing group in uh, uh, one version of the radar system has some code they've developed and we'd like to be able to carry that over into the next version of the product, and so uh, uh, that software will be uh, moved intact, but then modified however necessary to make it fit into the, the new requirements for that version. Uh, uh, and that's a good process. 
uh, effective and worth supporting, and part of what we're trying to do is to support that. Uh, uh, we also want to focus on uh, pure re uh, reuse, meaning uh, we, we are going to reuse existing components with no modification whatsoever. Uh, and that is doable. Um, uh, most modern languages provide all the technical details necessary to do that. We're not going to talk too much about uh, how to design software uh, for reuse without modification. Um, that will be a topic of another uh, presentation. But um, we definitely want to support that kind of uh, reuse. Basically, we, you know, you, you reuse those components perhaps by composition. One class uh, uses another class. And that, you know, the, the use class has to be designed so that it's flexible enough to fit into these um, various applications. And uh, our purpose in doing all this is to uh, improve productivity because we're just going to build fewer lines of code. Uh, software development, as we all know, is a very labor-intensive process, and uh, we'd like to improve that, uh, improve our productivity as much as possible um, uh, as we develop software. And also, reusing code means that um, there's defects and performance issues we're just not going to have because we didn't write new code. We're just reusing already existed and tested and fielded code. OK. So um, uh, reuse has both a good news story and a bad news story. Um, uh, the uh, compiler libraries and libraries like Boost that are associated with specific languages, Boost for C++, for example, uh, have been a, a, a major success story. Uh, um, uh, we all reuse that code again and again. We don't even think about it. It's so good that we don't even have to think about it. We just use those library facilities. Uh, and when a language gets updated, um, those li the, the libraries get updated, new features are added, and so on. So that's a real um, success story. Uh, for domain-specific code, the story is a little different. Software reuse in academic, uh, industrial, and commercial domains uh, has often been disappointed. The, the model there is that um, uh, we grab a, uh, a existing system and uh, we throw away the parts that we don't need, and we try to add in parts of, uh, for new uh, processing that we need. And we wind up spending an awful lot of time fixing breakage. Uh, sometimes the, the breakage can be so bad that we elect not to throw away the parts, just work around them. But then, of course, that causes a maintenance problem, because now a maintenance developer has to say, you know, is this, uh, is this uh, part of the software being used or not? So, uh, so our goal today is to talk about a mechanism for improving that uh, that domain-specific reuse. Uh, here's some domains I like to think about: uh, academic research and academic teaching are ones that I've been involved in for the last 20 years, uh, and. You know, uh, for academic research, there might be five or ten uh, developers in a research group, and uh, the code will live uh, for a while, not indefinitely, but it'll live for a while and be passed around uh, the, among the various um, uh, research students in that organization. Uh, and um, another domain is academic um, teaching, basically. Uh, in my experience teaching um, uh, half a dozen software design courses, I shared a lot of code in my classes uh, with the students in my classes uh, so that they could build projects who are a little more ambitious than they would be able to if they just uh, 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 wrote all the code themselves uh, from scratch. So, um, you know, we want to be able to support those kind of things. Open source development is an interesting case. Open source development uh, for things like you know Linux and Node.js and so on 
Uh, their model is quite different than our model. That's uh, uh, um, in open source development. Essentially, um, the developers are uh, making modifications to the platform and uploading them, and the platform gets built and matures. And then the reuse is everybody downloads this complete system. A different model than ours. Our model is that we're trying to serve up parts. We're trying to serve up components, very small, uh, highly um, uh, adaptable components, and bigger um, subsystems. Um, uh, you know, so um, I'm not sure that our, the methods we talk about today are applicable to open source development in general. Um, for industrial and commercial development, um, there, uh, 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 I think there is a real uh, use case for that in aerospace programs. I worked, I, I um, worked in a uh, department that uh, developed radar systems for the General Electric, Com uh, General Electric Company for a number of years. It's now Lockheed Martin. That business is part of Lockheed, uh, and. Um, software reuse there again. You know, a lot of times the reuse uh, uh, was well. We here's this body of code we used on system X. Now we'll port it over to our platform for system Y and do a whole bunch of fixing and and so on. So uh, there's opportunities um, for uh, domain specific. Reuse supporting domain specific reuse in ways better than all of these, with the exception, I think, of open source development, which already has a very nice functional model. All right, so what does it take uh, to support software use? So, uh, our goal here is to give application specific, or, uh, I'm sorry, domain specific code. The same kind of uh, advantages that a compiler library uh, gives us. That's a tall order. Uh, the, you know, the compiler libraries are enormously successful. And what we're trying to do uh, with fewer people, you know, it's um, um, uh, getting to the same level of reuse that a compiler library provides as a goal, uh, we'll, which ideally we approach as emphatic. We will never get there, but. Uh, we want to provide that kind of support. Uh, for reuse, the component needs to be designed, you know, in a way that reusing it is quicker and easier than uh, building it from scratch. And there's lots of good, you know, lots of good examples. The C++ standard template library and Apache uh, components are good examples of ways to build software so that it's reusable. Uh, now we want to use that same kind of those same kind of technologies to build it for application specific code. Uh, components have to be available. We can't reuse them unless they're widely available, some sort of cloud-based repository, and they need to be documented. Um, we need to present the concept for the component, some statement of use, uh, some examples of how it's used, some uh, uh, ideas about how it's designed and what its current status is um, uh, to make that reuse effective so that people don't have to uh, um, learn, you know, they don't have to decide is this component uh, what I want to use or not by looking at every line of code. You know, we don't want to do that. We want them to be able to fairly quickly make a decision. Yeah, this looks interesting. Uh, we'll set it aside and we'll look at all those lines of code. but. Well, you know, uh, it lets us quickly uh, sort out what's a good candidate for use and what's not. Okay, so uh, just as a little prologue for the implementation part, I built a website uh, for my Syracuse University classes. It's the second link uh, on the page, uh, and um, it was useful. It was uh, I liked the website, and I taught out of it, and I provided code to students for a number of years. But over the years, I uh, grew to feel uh, I um, I began to feel that uh, that it could be done better. It, it it wasn't as effective. It was it worked, but it wasn't quite as effective as it uh, I thought it should be. And this. 
first link, uh, the GitHub I/O link, uh, represents the uh, you know that leads to the site that uh, uh, we're building now uh, to try to improve on the processes that we uh, started out at Syracuse University. So. <clears throat> So for this site, this new site, uh, we want to improve on that first site's process by being a little more effective in the way we publish code. And uh, and uh, publishing it, what do we mean by publishing it? So um, it's the act of making it available somehow in some usable form. And there's a bunch of properties that that has. One is uh, containment. How do we hold on to these pieces and preserve them for others to use, how do we deliver them? Uh, if uh, we're trying to support reuse, we want to have large repositories so that there's a, a reasonable chance that the code actually will be reused. And so we have to locate in those large bodies the uh, code that might uh, be a target for our reuse. And finally, we have to maintain quality. Um, how do we do that? Uh, so uh, we're going to talk about each of those now. So uh, containment and delivery, they're solved problems. Uh, you know, GitHub does a beautiful job with that. Uh, we're using GitHub for containment and delivery uh, uh, for this site that I'm developing. Now, uh, indeed, uh, uh, you could argue the couple of things you might improve, but it's basically very, very, very good containment and delivery process. Uh, the main issues are how do you find code and how do you understand code that's relevant to some need I have. I have this particular function I need to implement. How do I find it? And how do I evaluate, you know, does this piece uh, really fit that? Uh, we want the collection to be large to support broad reuse, but now finding it um, is an interesting question. Uh, the option we've picked is to make website documentation co-located with source code. Obviously, you know, others have done that too. Uh, the uh, open source um, repositories, um, you know, Ubuntu, for example, does, does that same sort of thing. But uh, we're doing it in a special way, and uh, as we'll begin to see in just a minute. So this website has to have some sort of structure for holding on to these collections of code. And we want to think very carefully about how we organize them so that people can actually find stuff. Uh, as a little aside, let me mention that um, the site that I'm developing is a static site. And there's a reason for that. Uh, static sites are, are nice because uh, you can uh, uh, you can use, you can deliver them from a laptop, so I can walk into a meeting with my website uh, on my laptop and present any material out of that. Uh, uh, you know whether or not I have a good internet connection, or it doesn't matter. I can just present it in a in a meeting. Uh, the other thing is that repositories like GitHub uh, only publish static uh, static websites. Uh, GitHub, I and publishing the site, it doesn't cost me anything to do that, uh, uh, as long as it's static. But GitHub will not host non-static sites. And the reason is, you know, there's uh, millions of people using GitHub. And if all of them had non-static websites set up, the processing load would just be enormous. So, uh, so for those reasons, uh, I chose to make this a static site. Um, uh, and uh, so, you know, understand that um, that has some effect on what we're going to say, not a lot. So uh, we, ha we need a structure for holding on to these organized collections. We need to think very carefully about how to organize it. We need a very intuitive in uh, navigation process because, you know, we're not going to be there to hold somebody's hand. We want them to be able to come, open up the site, and immediately uh, figure out, you know, in a very natural way how to use it. it has to, we want the process to be as natural as possible. Uh, I think of these, uh, I've used the word component here. And um, we're, 
uh, on this site, we're actually trying to serve two kinds of things. We're trying to serve components, well, three things. We're trying to serve components. We're trying to serve up subsystems, uh, collections of components that are assembled uh, that give you more functionality. And we're also serving up some uh, finished programs, small little tools and things like that that are uh, relevant for the kinds of uh, code we're trying to support. Uh, we need to document. So if this publication process is going to be effective, we need to document each component. That means we need to talk about the concept, the design, the usage status. And we'll see in just a few minutes a couple of examples of that. Uh, we'll probably want to have some additional resources so that uh, people can uh, come up to speed with some of the, you know, some of the code we're using may be uh, fairly sophisticated and the users might need, some users might need some help. So we want some uh, language and some platform references and we want to have some code snapshots just to, um, uh, as illustrations so that uh, people can look at that and you know get some commentary about it. Uh, we want to have related blogs and opinion pieces to again help people uh, <clears throat> understand the parts we're serving up and understand the processes we're using. And we want some code standards. Uh, by code standards, I don't mean some huge document, you know, 300 pages of stuff that gets dropped on your desk, blam. I'm talking about a very simple statement, just uh, here are a minimum set of conditions. I, ideally, we can write them on a single page, maybe two. And here are the things that a component has to have in order to be considered as uh, uh, a candidate to be hosted by this site. And finally, uh, we want some stories and videos, uh, yeah, just again to augment this experience that people have with um, the code we're serving up. And I, I'll come back, especially to the stories, in a little bit. So here's the structure of the site. And I, I talked about organizing things, and I've thought about this a lot. Uh, and the scheme I came up with is uh, this is the, uh, can you see that pointer? This is the uh, index page, the home page for the site. And uh, you can always get to that. So this is a top menu bar. We'll see it in a couple of minutes. This is a top menu bar. Uh, <clears throat> each of the pages has a menu bar. They're not all the same. but uh, And if you click on home, you get to this page. And if you click on repros, you get to this collection of repositories. So this is C++ repository, C Sharp repository, JavaScript uh, repository, eventually a Java repository, and so on. <clears throat> probably won't be a COBOL repository. Probably won't be a Fortran repository. But you know, you get the idea. And uh, for some um, uh, use, for some, uh, for example, a radar manufacturer. You might choose not to organize things by language, but you might organize by product. This is the solid state radar. This is the Tipsy 59 radar. This is the, you know, and so on. Uh, each of these repository pages, this is, this uh, repository page has a bunch of links. We're going to look at it in just a minute. And each, uh, each of them links to documentation for that particular repository. So in CPP repositories, there is one CPP Utilities Repository, among many others. And it, uh, we're, this is its documentation. And then that links directly to the code. So it's a nice flow process. You know, We go to the repositories. We look for something we're interested in. We can look at its document. And if it turns out it's not what we want, we can flick through some more of the documentation and then quickly get to the code. OK, let's just, let's just go to the site and just take a quick look. So here's a, here's a view of uh, the site as it's uh, in its current phase. Uh, you might notice this uh, top border is a little different than uh, the one in my diagram. I just uh, I've been making some changes lately, and uh, it's designed so that as you scan over it, you can see those drop downs and uh, immediately get an idea of what's here in this you know. The whole idea of doing it this way is uh, it's a quick way of understanding what's here. 
Now, our main focus is on the repositories, and that's why this link is here. And I've divided this up into C++, C++, uh, Sharp, and uh, JavaScript. I do most of my development in C++, and so most of the repositories are there. Here's what this page looks like. So this is the document page, uh, documentation page. So uh, what we're looking at right now, this thing here, is just this guy right here. Okay. And if we uh, click on one of these links, we get a table that says, oh, here's CPP utilities, and what it, it has some helper code, and here's how you can get to the repository, and a little bit of status. Uh, and we can also just skip across the top. If we have, uh, once we get used to what's here, we can just skip across the top to find all the various parts, the kinds of things that are uh, stored in this repository. So I've organized them by utilities and tools. So these are um, execution images, and these are components, um, you know, the small reusable components. Uh, libraries are bigger collections. For example, uh, until uh, C++17, there was no uh, library for managing directory information. So I wrote one using the platform APIs uh, called File System. Now C++17 has come out with one, uh, and so um, uh, I'll eventually replace that. And projects, these are larger projects that are more like examples. So, so um, uh, CPP parser shows how one particular library is being used. And now here's a whole bunch of demos that are for people who are trying to, you know, just understand, learn C++, for example. Um, so basic demos and, you know, compound object, object factory, just a bunch of information about uh, uh, C++. Uh, and we're not going to, you know, not going to talk um, too much about that today. but. So let's, uh, so, uh, and now, so that's, you know, kind of a picture of the repositories. Uh, let me go back. Uh, there's one thing I meant to mention and I didn't. So let's just go here and uh, let's just pull up. Here's CPP utilities. Now we're looking at uh, one of the documentation pages. So let me pull this up. So what we're looking at right now is this guy. This is a documentation page, which linked from this page. Uh, and, you know, it has a concept and usage and requirements and so on. Uh, and that leads directly, if I click on this link, as I showed you before, I go to the uh, repository code itself. And each of these has a little quick status. You can get an idea of, you know, where we are, no known problems, and so on, blah, blah, blah. So. Um, that's that model. Okay. Uh, we also have blogs uh, that, let me just quickly show you a little bit about that. So here's the blogs. Uh, first thing is just my introductory blog. We have a draw blog on software design and design principles. Um, uh, you know, the solid principles plus some more. A discussion of object-oriented design and models, and uh, uh, as we scroll down, we begin to get into some of the things that are code stored on the site: message passing, communication, uh, no SQL database, parsing, code analyzer. All these things are things that are uh, currently reside in the in the uh, uh, repository. So it's a chance to talk a little bit about uh, the documentation describes the code. These blogs tend to focus a little more about the ideas and how they're put together. Uh, so, and we also have uh, resource resources. And so, these resources, you know, uh, presentation diagrams, conferences, uh, uh, design processes, project suggestions. I've uh, taught thousands of students over the years, and a lot of them will come to me and say, gee, I want to get some more practice. Can you suggest a project? And so uh, I put together a list of uh, projects, you know, just a, mm, fun things to work on. I'm going to work on some of these once I get most of the site put together. And uh, so, you know, some of these projects are 
challenging technical. Some of them are fairly simple exercises. Some of them are kind of wacky ideas, you know, uh, that just might be fun to explore a little bit. Uh, so that's resources. And then stories. So the stories, uh, you know, I have a storyteller. That's this guy. So we're looking at the interface of the storyteller. And uh, you know, if I clicked on a story like the C++ story, I have next and previous and, and so on. I can navigate around that story. Now, uh, a lot of these pages have uh, sequences. So, for example, uh, in the repositories, when I get to the repositories, uh, I can just uh, let's just go to repository and let's just uh, pull up the first one. And now, if I just um, uh, click next or hit the end key, I just cycle through them. So the pages themselves have a sequence. Not all the pages do. If if I'm looking at a page that's not part of a sequence, then the next and previous buttons won't appear. But um, uh, when we tell stories, we want to put together uh, stories that may, two or three different stories may use uh, the same web page. And so we need another mechanism beside these internal linkages. So the, that next and previous were just hidden links, and the buttons activate those hidden links, and there's only one sequence. They're only going to be in that one link list of pages. But the storyteller allows us through because it holds an array of addresses of pages, I can organize them, you know, independent of those. I can have a story sequence that's independent of the page sequence. So that was that uh, that model. And the stories ideas, you know, uh, started out as kind of a wacky idea. Gee, wouldn't it be interesting if? And uh, I think the the you know the jury has kind of come back and said, yeah, it's a pretty good idea. I've had several uh, people who are reviewing for me come back and say, yeah, it's a pretty good idea. I like some of the stories. Oh, there's material about platforms and uh, code snaps. Uh, uh, we'll see a little more of that in a couple of minutes. So uh, <clears throat> one thing I want to make clear is what we really mean by repository. So uh, here's two definitions. One, the first one is a Wikipedia definition. It says that a repository is a storage location for software packages where they may be re re retrieved and installed. And the model here really is some some collection. Uh, uh, maybe the whole site is called a repository, and it has lots and lots and lots of packages. Uh, the second definition I've given is the GitHub definition, and that's much narrower. A repository is like a folder for your project. A project repository contains all of your project files and stores. So, so when I talk about repositories, I'm talking about my site holding many repositories where each repository is like a project you might build in an IDE. Okay? So uh, that's what we mean by repository. So now here's a you know a page about the site description is kind of trying to tie everything together. <clears throat> so uh, if we look at the CPP repositories, this is a page out of these CPP repositories on thread pools. I have a thread pool component, and <clears throat> uh, um, you know, and so uh, we go from that. Repositories page with a link, we get to this documentation. If we decide, hey, that looks interesting, I may want to reuse it, we can click on the thread pool link and go there. <clears throat> so uh, um, because we're trying to provide effective uh, support for reuse, the, the repositories, we want the repositories to be large uh, so, that, so that a user has a, a, a good chance of actually finding something useful. And so the issue, of course, is if there's large, how do we find stuff in all that? So the model here is we link from the home page down to these uh, uh, repository pages factored into some organization. Might be, I've done it by language, but it might be product specific, you know, uh, collection, whatever. And 
we want to factor each of those collections individual parts, you know, individual repositories like utilities and tools and uh, libraries and so on. And the model here is we link first to the documentation and then to the code. And that seems to be a, you know, a really natural sequence and people seem to be able to get comfortable with that pretty quickly. Uh, stories, so uh, we've already covered a little bit of that. Uh, they're basically organized collections of pages in a site. Uh, I initially thought they were going to be organized collections of pages in a site. It turns out that uh, the majority of the stories are really pages that wouldn't have been placed in this site. They're not stuff we're serving up, not documentation of what we're serving up. They're telling a story that's related. So. <clears throat> uh, they may not be pages, but uh, some of the stories are pages from the site. For example, there's a story about the site, and that's just using various pages, sort of like we're doing this morning, just looking at various pages to get an idea what this site does. Uh, and these stories, the intent is to just let people uh, deal with the content of the site more effectively. And so, you know, we have a C++ story, site story. Um, Mike Corley did a nice um, uh, uh, story about uh, machine language uh, processing using PowerShell, and that's where the MLIPS name came from. So, uh, And what we see over here, this is the storyteller interface, and it's got you know a bunch of buttons, and you know, we won't go over its operation, but uh, just to give you the idea of what's here. Uh, code snaps. So code snaps, the idea of the code snaps are to give us a quick, easy way of seeing code. So the repositories, we can go to the repository, download the code, pull it up in an IDE, and look at it. But a lot of things, especially the smaller pieces, we'd like to short circuit that process and just look at the code immediately. And so we do that with these code snaps. So let me go to a page where we have code snaps. So here's some code snaps. Here's a very typical uh, typical uh, set. So here, a code snap on pointers and references. So up pulls, this is just source code, demo source code, that has been configured to be a web page. In other words, any markup characters were um, transcribed using escape sequences, and this is embedded in uh, pre uh, uh, and pre tag between pre tags and given a you know HTML uh, body and so on. So the model of this is simply let's have a really quick and uh, a fast way to view some important pieces of code. So for C++, you know, class anatomy, uh, what are the parts of a typical C++ class? How do strings work? How does inheritance and compound object work? How do templates work? You know, these are uh, topics that <clears throat> um, I've been writing C++ since 1988, and I don't remember all the details. You know, all the modern programming languages are relatively big, and nobody's going to remember all the details. So, you know, these are here. A lot of these I wrote just so that I would help me remember how to do something. But I think they're useful for a learning process as well. So, okay, so now let's kind of uh, think about all of this. Let's step back a little bit and say, okay. So, a repository, repositories, there's this law of nature that's the, that's, you know, entropy says that it's highly likely that the contents of your repository over time will slowly degrade and get worse and worse and worse. And we don't want that to happen. That means that there has to be control on entry and weeding out of what is no longer appropriate from the repository. Um, so, uh, so without quality control, it's easier for them to be, become a sea of flotsam and jetsam. I've defined that, you know, flotsam is cargo that floats up to the surface when a when a sailing ship sank, and and uh, jetsam was stuff that in a storm. Sailors would throw over the rail, you know, trying to keep the uh, ship afloat. So uh, to avoid having lots of flotsam and jetsam in a repository, we need an effective structure. That's what we've been talking about uh, for disclosing the contents. And I think the site provides a pretty reasonable candidate for that. It certainly 
surely can be others. Uh, but also a willingness of the sponsor of the site to invest in review and improvement. You know, standards, and by that I don't mean a big document, just a brief statement that the components have to meet in order to become candidates, and then some knowledgeable person or persons to uh, evaluate a component against the standards and, and admit them and reject them, and, you know, a continuing background review activity. For example, Suppose uh, you and I are working in uh, a uh, software engineering group in a radar department development, and we've just finished work on uh, a particular NATO radar, and uh, might be a really good idea if the uh, software architect and the team leads and the project manager got together in a little group, sort of a sayonara process of saying what. Uh, from the code uh, in the, that we developed for this NATO radar, should we put in the repository for subsequent uh, radars we built? So sort of a little review process. I think that's an excellent thing to do. And in order to make that effective, you have to have some structure like this, okay? It uh, doesn't do much good if you just say, yeah, that's good, and that's good, and that's good, and uh, so what do we do? We just zip it all up and shove it in this archive, that really hasn't accomplished much at all. Okay, so uh, quality control is an issue. Um, also, another purpose of this site is to experiment. I've been experimenting with ways to make these, uh, trying to make the uh, uh, information transfer, make the site as effective as it can be in delivering technical content. So let's go look at this test, for example. So these are widget tests. Let me uh, blow this up. These are widget tests. And, uh, you know, I have, these are just various tests that I make. They're not anything I'm saving. Uh, I am saving them in a test repository. But, for example, here's a uh, I, uh, you may have noticed already, I've got a bunch of diagrams in the site. So here's a, uh, a block that I can expand by clicking on and contract by clicking on the title. And if I want to get rid of it, I just click the close. And should I want to, you know, should I want to reopen it, I can just refresh the page. My, uh, my footer uh, has a little JavaScript that does a page reload, so. Uh, and here's a photo sizer that just leaves off the click, you know. And what I'm showing here, is these were built with the, with the new web component standards coming out of W3C. Uh, they were originally uh, sponsored by Google. They're similar in concept to React and Vue and those. I chose to use these because I, my, you know, it's my expectation that they will eventually become uh, fairly broadly used generic standards and, you know, tested photo blocks and code blocks and stuff like that. And uh, all kinds of experiments. So, um, um, slide in panel, uh, you know, so here's the slide in panel. And you might say, experiment, you know, what do you mean experiment? Everybody, you know, uh, slide and panels have been used for years. What do you mean you're experiment? Well, uh, what I'm trying to do is see, is this known, <laughs> you know, very standard web technique? Is this something I want to use in the site? Does it work well with the kind of stuff that I'm doing on the site? Um, and uh, some of these, not all of these, uh, not all of these are successful. Let me, uh, here's a little experiment I did. This is not experimenting with a component. Uh, it was experimenting with draggable stuff. Uh, and it's just here to make sure that I correctly handled dragging with mouse and with touch. If this was, a, this isn't a touch screen, is it, Mike? If this was a touch screen, I could put my finger on there and move it around. Uh, so it's just an experiment to make that work. And then I've used that. In uh, here's an experiment that I thought would be great, and it turns out I don't like it. So this is just a splitter bar, you know. And so I can make the image bigger, text smaller. And it seems like at first blush, she has a really great idea. But I tried using it someplace, and what I discovered was most of the time, 
you know, either this guy had a lot of empty space or this guy had a lot of empty space, and I just didn't like the way it worked. So, but uh, the model here is not so much the specific experiments that I did, <clears throat> you know, experimenting with uh, themes too as well, brown theme and green theme and so on. Uh, but that um, the site was intended to be a uh, intended to be a um, uh, uh, a uh, vehicle for um, trying out ideas to make the publication process more effective. So it's trying to build a candidate to, uh, of a demonstration of effective publication, <coughs> but it's also trying to be a way to experiment with and try out some new things. Okay. So here's uh, our conclusion. So uh, most of the structure I've talked about is in place, up and going. I've got lots more code I want to put in it, and I'm, you know, I'm still, for example, the C plus. I have a C plus plus story I'm still working on, and probably won't finish until early next year. I've got, uh, I think, more than 60 repositories now at the current count. <clears throat> I've got several stories. Uh, Mike wrote one, and another former student wrote one, and I'm working on a couple. Uh, lots of resources and code snaps. Uh, and I plan to, you know, install lots more code repositories. Um, I have no Java uh, on the site now at all. I intend to have a Java repository, and uh, I'm interested in Java 11 and playing around with the um, Java modules, which I think started in Java 9, but I haven't had a chance to play with them yet. <coughs> so, I'm, you know, uh, looking at some of that. Uh, I also intend eventually to have a starter site, so that it's nice for me to say, hey, here's a good model. But if it isn't easy for somebody to pick it up and use it, what's the point? So I intend to uh, build a starter static site just so that, you know, not near, it doesn't have nearly all the stuff that this has, just to keep it simple and so, you know, give people a place to start. There are other, there are frameworks that build static sites, uh, um, uh, Jekyll, uh, Jenkins, and, uh, you know, there's all, uh, a raft of them, whole series of, uh, frameworks for building static sites, and so, you know, you could use them. Uh, so, uh, my conclusions are, I think that uh, the, the static sites, uh, they're a good tool for publishing. The main issue with a static site is you can't implement search on the site because you don't have any processing on the site to go look for things. The whole idea of a static site is that it doesn't use server processing other than just to other than just to deliver the the resource, uh, so uh, <clears throat> we're attacking that two ways. One is to try to make the structure uh, navigation very simple and intuitive and obvious, and make that really effective. And also, uh, eventually, I intend to set up a process to make it really easy um, to uh, create a mirror site. Uh, perhaps using uh, some PowerShell components that just, you know, on a regular schedule download uh, new stuff from the site. And so we have this mirror site that always represents the current stuff that's on uh, GitHub. And so every time we want to search, we can simply search in the mirror site. And now we have we can have tools <coughs> locally that, that search through that local material and all that will, you know, that'll work just fine. So. You know, with the help of some of my friends like Mike, uh, we'll probably uh, uh, do that eventually. So uh, um, I have some uh, appendices here that talk about the domains. I'm going to skip these, and you know, you can look at them if you wish to. Let's uh, now turn to questions, if there are any. So. Uh, so, if folks have any questions for for uh, for uh, for Jim, uh, just uh, you can uh, ask them via the chat. Uh, uh, so, I've, I've just got some you know basic questions, Jim, on the you know the components. Uh, is there kind of a um, 
standard for like, you know, say complexity or size, you know, lines of code. I, I'm assuming that they're your components. Yeah. Your res Go ahead. Yeah, there are lots of standards, meaning there isn't a standard. <laughs> so, okay. okay. Uh, my own model, here's my own model. Uh, I like to think of a component as being uh, one or two classes uh, that have maybe a maximum of seven or eight uh, public methods uh, with very simple interfaces and not a whole lot of other than the, depending on the compiler libraries, just you know, uh, just one or two uh, packages that depend on each other. Uh, and so you know, you're uh, probably talking about three or four or five pages of code max, no more than that. Uh, uh, maybe a couple of hundred lines of code uh, for a component. Now a subsystem might be much larger. A subsystem might be. Uh, uh, a thousand lines of code, ten thousand lines of code. Even I have some subsystems in the repository that have ten thousand lines of source lines of code in them. Uh, so, but uh, for a component, the model is that they're small, don't have many dependencies, and they're easy to use. And that means that they take advantage of inheritance and templates. And some other techniques that most of the uh, are coming into most of the languages, uh, things like lambdas and so on. So um, that getting into the details of that really is a, a, a you know fodder for another presentation, which I'd be happy to do some later time. But okay. anyway, that's so, my yeah, model. Just, great. Yeah, I just I just wanted to try and get a you know a basic idea of. You know your you know your concept of the component. So that was that, yeah. that's exactly yeah. what I was what I was looking for. Yeah. And to and put uh, it, that, to put to put that into perspective, this probably out of the sixty repositories, maybe there's ten that are real components, and the rest are subsystems or or tools. But anyway. Okay. 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 So you know the uh, you know and I think this this ties in this you know this ties in nicely with with our, our information analysis center because you know one of the things we're trying to do um, you know is uh, you, you know we're looking at you know reusing technology we're trying to avoid duplication of effort so I mean if you if you're developing software and um, you know, you've got a, uh, you, you've wrote a piece of code that works, you know, it functions correctly, uh, you know, to be able to take that, you know, as a, as a building block in, in a, you know, in a, as you're creating another piece of software to, you know, be able to, to reuse that. I mean, that, that just seems to tie in, um, you know, very appropriately with our, with our mission here at, in, in the IX. I agree. And there's another aspect of that too, that uh, might tie in well. And that is that, <clears throat> this would be a good vehicle for uh, showing uh, threat cases, uh, vulnerability cases. So uh, a fairly modest piece of code that illustrates if you do it this way, here's what happens. So there's this vulnerable uh, example, and then some uh, hacking code. You know, test drivers, four or five test drivers that hack into it in different ways. Uh, and uh, use that to classify some of the main threat vectors. I think that would be a, a absolutely terrific thing to do. Uh, one of our uh, faculty here at Syracuse University, uh, Dr. Kevin Dew, is doing uh, exactly that. He's teaching a series of seminars, and he presents things in very much that way. Okay. I think that, uh, you know, I, I, I think that might be a really good thing, uh, you know, to think about. Uh, uh, bringing to the uh, you know the party for uh, this particular you know uh, organization and set up. Yeah, and in fact, I, I was uh, you know w w you know one of the areas in in, in the CSI Act, of course, is, is the cybersecurity, and so I, I was you know I, I was uh, curious as to you know. As you've taken a piece of software, you know you've used it. You've kind of ringed out the kinks. Um, you know, I was kind of thinking that that would help to in ensure the quality of your software. You know, 
because you know you you've got a tested case you know you've you know you've used it before you you know you know what it does you know the ins and outs yeah. of it whereas you know if you start with a fresh piece of software you know there's always the you know the human factor there's always you know if you're in a hurry or if you're under the gun there's always that you know possibility where you kind of open yourself up you leave some door open you leave yourself open for some kind of a sure. an attack so it seems it seems like this this approach here you know c- com- components that have been you know tested uh you know seems seems like it would improve the uh the overall uh assurance of the of the software system yeah and it might help support the uh, you know the whole life cycle so up comes a component and we've looked at it and uh, thought about it and uh think it's uh, the greatest thing since cottage cheese but when we get lots of eyes looking at it you know when you publish it like this is the opportunity for lots of eyes to look at it and you'll start to get <coughs> comments about things you never even thought about so um i agree with you yep it's uh i think it's a uh really good fit you know and, and and as it just just as it happens to turn out we have we have one of one of our folks uh, one of our folks is is i think down in the dc area uh this week and they're actually participating uh there's a, a dod software assurance community of practice and uh so I, I think I think maybe if we could try to you know make the folks aware of your you know your site here and um, you know have them take a look at it maybe we can get some collaboration going with them and uh, you know see if there's some reuse uh, you know that they could take advantage of this uh, you know of, the, of your of your site as well. Sure, and uh, you know uh, as well they'd be welcome to uh, pass back comments. Uh, Things they like, things they didn't like. You know, if they thought they found errors or anything like that, that, I'm always happy to get that kind of feedback. Okay, all right, yeah, that'd be great. Um, so now, all the uh, all the software on your site uh, has that um, is all the code on there. Has that all been developed by you, or I, I know you've mentioned, uh, you know, like Mike Corley, uh, you know, provided a story, but like all the actual software code developed was that that you or, or, or have others contributed as well? Uh, it's uh, so I wrote, uh, I think, every single line of code, but you know, I taught in Syracuse University for a lot of years, and so I would have smart students and smart TAs, and they would do something, and I would say, gee, that's a great idea. I'm going to steal that, you know, and, and give them attribution <laughs> and stuff. But so, you know, my code reflects. Just like anybody's code, you know, uh, you read and you look at, you watch conference videos, and you know, and uh, a teacher is very fortunate to have students who are very happy to give them feedback, positive and negative. And uh, so, you know, the code that's there is all informed by that. I won't promise you that I've written every single line, but I can't think of any code that I didn't write that didn't flow through my fingers. But again, you know. It was informed by an awful lot of looking at other code and and other people's suggestions and ideas. So, so, so at a, at a minimum, you've had you've had eyeballs on it at least. Uh, uh, I, you know, I've I've really genuinely written every piece of it. So, yeah, <laughs> but I've had other eyeballs. Yeah, no, I see what you mean. I've had other eyeballs look into this code too. Um, okay. You know, the responsibility for its correctness is all you know all mine. <laughs> you know, yep. I won't. Yep. Don't want to blame anybody else if there's, uh, and you know, every software developer knows that um, they're late in errors. You, if you have any sizable body of code, this is going to be late in errors. Uh, you know, every line of code, there's probably five decisions that are made. You know, almost always they're trivial. You know, what type do I use here? What you know? How do I arrange the syntax? Uh, you know, um, uh, uh, what, what you know? Do I put this on the heap? Uh, leave it static? Just four or five for every line of code. Now, when you multiply that by even for a modest sized subsystem of a hundred thousand lines of code, okay, that's five hundred thousand decisions that you made. When you make five hundred thousand decisions, not you are not going to make every one of them correctly. There are going to be. So we know that there are, uh, you know, latent errors in there, but, you know, they get weeded out over time. And uh, 
two things help that. One is you get lots of people looking at it, uh, giving feedback. And the other thing is that this kind of structure of boards um, makes it easy to use test harnesses and keep track of and manage the testing and maturing of a piece of code. Uh, I am, uh, I've been focusing mostly on just putting content in place and not much on assembling the test tools that I've used on them, but uh, that's one of the, you know, over the course of the spring probably, I'll be doing a lot of, uh, you know, putting in place test harnesses and rerunning them on my code. And, you know, because I've been changing it, I'll find some latent errors and stuff like that, so. Sure, sure. Yeah. Okay, uh, well, it's, that sounds good. Is there, we're, we're kind of nearing the end of our, our normal, time is there is there any uh, last comments anything you you'd like to to add that um you know in closing here or um the only thing um i'd i'd like to add you know whoever's participating uh thanks for your interest and uh, it's been fun for me to do this and uh you know i'm sure we'll do it again you know as long as there was enough interest to, so that uh you know it makes sense to do it again uh i'm sure we'll do things that are related to this so uh, and if anybody, you know, in the audience uh, has questions, uh, they can start by funneling them through your organization. But I have a Piazza site, and uh, I've forgotten where I I hadn't made I haven't made a big deal about it. But uh, I intend that the Piazza site be associated with my GitHub site. Uh, to collect comments and feedback. So, uh, Mike, you remind me, and I will put uh, in some very evident place a link to the Piazza site so that now, you know, any of the current viewers or viewers that uh, may add in, they can find a way to contact me with comments and questions and ideas and so on. So I'll do that in the next day or two. I'll put a link to my Piazza site. By the way, okay. if you don't know, Piazza is a typically used for uh, academic purposes as a as a message board for classes. And I contacted the Piazza people and said, you know, is it within the, your notion of fair use for me to use the site um, to uh, manage my uh, error tracking and so on on my GitHub website? And they got back to me and said, yeah, sure, it's great. Um, go right ahead. So. So that'll be up in a in a day or two. Okay, that sounds, that, that sounds good. Yeah, thank you guys, and I'll say sayonara. Okay, Jim. Yeah, yeah. I just want to, you know, the thank thank you again. I mean, appreciate this, and you know, I think the you know the area of uh, you know software development, uh, you know, so, you know, software is critical in you know uh, so many so many systems. Uh, you know, uh, it touches touches everything pretty much everything we do so um you know to be, be able to write you know quality software you know that's got as few errors uh, and bugs as possible uh you know I, I just think that's uh you know very important and for the for the military it gets especially critical so uh, thank right. you for uh sharing this information you know with the with the community and you know we just uh you know extend our uh thanks and appreciation Good. Well, thank you, Steve. Uh, I, I've enjoyed it. And uh, with that, ciao. Okay. Have a good one, everybody. We'll uh, we'll see you next month. Thanks now, and have 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 happy holidays to to all. Bye bye now. Okay.